In 1950 the U.S. Senate convened a high-profile committee to investigate the growing problem of organized crime in America. Popularly known as the Kefauver Committee, after its chairman Senator Estes Kefauver, its findings included admissions of the FBI's failure to combat countrywide mob activity, leading to more than 70 local crime commissions to combat the mafia at local level, and a nationwide racketeer-influenced and corrupt organizations act. Unusually for the time, the proceedings were televised, with more than 30 million viewers eagerly tuning in to watch the testimonies of infamous gangsters, Mickey Cohen, Frank Costello, Jake Greasy Thumb, Music and others. Narrowly escaping a public grilling on this occasion was a struggling club singer called Frank Sinatra. Counsel Joseph L. Nellis questioned the singer in advance to determine his suitability for the stand, and the Kefauver Committee ultimately decided that no real purpose would be served by a Sinatra subpoena. His career was ailing at the time and the committee generously opted not to finish him off by tarring him with the Mafia brush. However, during his questioning Sinatra nevertheless admitted to more than passing acquaintances with a significant list of made men, Lucky Luciano, Bugsy Siegel, Willie Moretti and Al Capone's cousins, the Fischetti brothers. Sinatra would not escape similar hearings in the future. While he always denied any mafia involvement, his name kept cropping up. He was called before a joint Senate House Select Committee on Crime, along with his fellow Rat Pack performer Sammy Davis Jr., investigating gambling and corruption related to sport, in 1972. There was further public testimony, and further denials, in the hearings of the Nevada Gaming Control Board in 1981, where Sinatra was seeking to obtain a lucrative gambling license for his Las Vegas interests. They were never proven, but the whispers of Sinatra's intimate links to the mob were never silenced either. Was he really part of the mafia? Or was he, as many have concluded, just a groupie, in love with the life but content to watch from the sidelines? Possible mafia ties stretch back to Sinatra's grandfather's youth in Sicily, the Italian island that was the birthplace of the Cosa Nostra. Frank's grandfather, Francesco Sinatra, was born in 1857 in the hill town of Lurcara Fridi, Mafia Heartland only about 25 kilometers 15 miles from the famous town of Corleone. While there's no evidence that Francesco was involved in any dubious undertakings, he lived on the same street as the Luciano family, whose most famous son Salvatore, nicknamed Lucky, would come to be considered one of the fathers of organized crime in New York in years to come. Lucky's address book even contained the name of one of Francesco's in-laws, so it's entirely possible that Francesco and the Lucianos were personally acquainted. Francesco Sinatra emigrated to New York in 1900 with his wife and five children. The young Antonino, Frank's father, became an apprentice shoemaker, but also worked as a chauffeur and a professional bantamweight boxer. He had run-ins with the law involving a hit-and-run accident, for which he narrowly escaped a manslaughter conviction, and for receiving stolen goods. He married Frank's mother Dolly in 1913, and Frank himself was born, an only child, two years later. Dolly was a midwife, known to some as Hatpin Dolly due to her notoriety for performing illegal backstreet abortions, for which she was convicted twice. But she was also heavily involved in local Hoboken and Jersey City politics, working for two successive mayors at a time when the boroughs were infamous for corruption. When she and Antonino opened a bar in 1917, she became well known for bouncing drunks on the streets with her ever-present Billy Club. The bar was the environment in which the young Frank Sinatra grew up, at a time when selling alcohol was illegal thanks to USA's prohibition laws and, specifically, the Volstead Act. 
Frank would be doing his homework in the evenings in the corner of an establishment that could only remain in business thanks to his father's bootlegging activities with the local gangster Waxy Gordon, who in turn was connected to Lucky Luciano. Hoboken, as a port town, was a major transit point for illicit alcohol shipments and Frank's uncles, Dolly's brothers, were also heavily embroiled in the trade. Prohibition, perversely, was big business if you were on the wrong side of the law. It was the making of the mafia in the United States. Frank's upbringing certainly wasn't racked with hardship. His family rode out the Great Depression of the 1930s to the extent that Dolly bought him a brand new car for his 15th birthday. Despite his constant exposure to mob activities, Frank seized on a different racket very early in life. He gave his first public performances singing along to the player piano in the Sinatra Bar and Grill, at the age of about eight. Misty-eyed tough guys would give him pocket money for his renditions of sentimental popular songs of the day, and a future star was born. His first professional break as a singer came in 1935 when he was 20, as a member of local singing group the Hoboken Four, they were a trio until Dolly leaned on them to let Frank join. This led to years of singing in clubs and bars in New York and around the country, an occupation in which fraternizing with mobsters and their bosses would have been completely unavoidable. Organized crime went hand in hand with the bar business, and even after prohibition ended, the mob remained silent partners in many businesses. They were also heavily involved in the music industry, controlling most of the jukeboxes nationwide, and therefore dictating what records would be successful. Saloons are not run by the Christian Brotherhood, Sinatra hedged in later life. A lot of guys were around that had come out of Prohibition and ran pretty good saloons. I worked in places that were open. They paid. They came backstage. They said hello. They offered you a drink. If St. Francis of Assisi was a singer and worked in saloons he'd have met the same guys. That doesn't make him part of something. Sinatra enjoyed a very good year in 1939 he had a contract with bandleader Tommy Dorsey, a hot enough act for Sinatra's national profile to be hugely increased. In his first year with Dorsey, Sinatra recorded more than 40 songs and topped the charts for two solid months with I'll Never Smile Again. But Sinatra's relationship with Dorsey was a troubled one, and their parting in 1942 began the first public rumblings of Sinatra's possible mafia connections.